Okay, welcome everyone to this session on Beyond Edge or Preparing for Digitalization. My name is Jutta Eckstein and I'm an Agile coach, consultant, what else, trainer, author, speaker. Um, I started off with Agile actually with my first XP project, I think it was in 98, or no, 97, so feels like I'm in, I'm in the Agile world forever. However, uh, well, and I wrote about that stuff, about my experiences. However, today I want to talk about my newest thing, which is also, well, which is the Beyond Agile, and it's also my latest book, which just came out last week. So, and it's available also in India, so that's a good thing. Um, so, well, maybe I don't say more about that. We dive into it. So, preparing for digitalization, first of all, what are the times we are living in right now? You might have heard that term already over the course of the conference. VUCA, it, I think it hasn't been mentioned today, I'm not quite sure. So VUCA stands for Volatile, Uncertain, Complex and Ambiguous and these are the times we are living in. So it's really just hard to plan a year in advance, even like half a year in advance because things will change so rapidly that we, the plan is worthless as soon as it's done and therefore we cannot do more of the same, we have to do things in a different way. And with the book, huh, something else is coming along, which is digitalization, which is the theme of the day. And digitalization actually means that almost every company is a software company, and maybe the company doesn't know it yet. So that's kind of the, the big thing here. Now, now in software, we know that Agile is at least the thing people talk about. Some are doing it more or less successfully. However, it's kind of the popular thing in software, which means now software through digitalization is getting more and more at the core of companies, means that Agile is getting more and more at the core of companies. So that's kind of the the thing, which is also a problem because, well, if you look at the manifesto, the, the core values, I assume you all have seen that. Have, who has not seen that? Okay, so I, I don't want to go into that. The thing is, if you look at that, and also even more, if you dive deeper into the principles, they have been created all around software. Well, the general mindset, well, general underlying values, they still can be useful, but it's just hard to, to go in companies and say, well, in order for preparing for digitalization, just be Agile. And then they take a look at what Agile is and they say, well, that's not applicable for us because if we look at the organizational level or at the whole company, not everything we do in the company focuses on doing software despite of digitalization. There's stuff like HR, finance, whatever, they might use software. Well, they definitely do, but their core product is at first not software. So what's needed is a kind of translation, and this is what we did. We looked at the values and principles and tried to come up with values that are in the same mindset, in the same spirit, but are applicable outside of software, so preparing the beyond Agile and the, for the digitalization. And the values we came up with were self-organization, transparency, constant customer focus, and continuous learning. Now for those values, actually for implementing those, there is a lot of stuff out there. And it's not just we in the Agile field thinking of how to prepare for digitalization or for being more agile as a company. Now speaking of the lowercase a agile, so flexible, adaptive, responsive, being able to deal with the VUCA challenges. There are many more. So this is, I'm not sure, probably you can't read it far back and maybe not even really in the front. There, there are really a lot of streams out there and I just want to pick a few like 
There are some specific implementations like Mondragon, Gore, or Semco in Brazil, Morningstar, we have heard about them, I think, yesterday. Then uh, there are philosophies like what Senge is proposing, or theory, theory you might be something you have heard about. There are facilitation techniques, growth cafe, appreciative inquiry, egalitarian methods, holacracy, a big thing, world blue, maybe not so known. Um, so there, there is a lot of stuff out there. And so we have dived into that and, and looked at those and took a little bit of a Goldilocks approach. We thought we don't want to go for a specific implementation. For example, what you hear a lot that people say, well, we use the Spotify model. If you ever have talked to Spotify people, they would tell you there is no such thing as a Spotify model. Because they might talk about it, blog about it, but the soon they are done talking, blogging about it, this thing has changed. And so people just copy like one snapshot of what Spotify is doing, but don't grasp that what Spotify really is doing is changing all the time and not having like this one fixed model. So we just felt like a specific implementation is too specific. And the other thing, like philosophies, they are too generic on the other hand. So it's not concrete enough. Well, they still, it all guided us. So what we did was picking four streams where we thought they will combine address the challenges we are facing. And these are the four streams we were picking. And you see, it creates, maybe we picked them because it created that great acronym with Bossa Nova. So beyond budgeting, which is addressing actually more or is coming more from the finance and HR part, then we have open space from the, as a facilitation technique, but it's really more like focusing on inspiration. I just, in, in a, well, on the next slide, I go briefly into all of those. Then sociocracy, which looks more in um, the power structure in companies and agile, well, I guess you, you know about that. So now, briefly looking at this, so this talk is not a dive into all of these streams, right? So just to, to give you a little bit of a, a background here. So beyond budgeting, despite the name, it's not about budgeting, actually. Well, it started in finance, but the core thing is that they say we are a system toward a management model that is more empowered and adapted. Well, that sounds very agile to me. However, again, they are coming from the finance part, and so the way beyond budgeting says you can implement this is by looking at what's the purpose of a budget. And actually, the purpose of a budget has, is threefolded. And we are trying to put all these three purposes normally in one number. And this one number tries to express what are we aiming for, that's the target, then what we think will happen, that's the forecast, and then how much do we want to spend where? And that's the allocation. And so all these three things we put together into one number and the suggestion of beyond budgeting for providing more flexibility and being able to adapt to change is to separate those out. So we have targets as one thing and the targets are at best that's a recommendation relative. So Maybe it's a too simplistic example, but still, I hope it brings the point across. If I'm a salesperson and my target, my boss gives me, is I should sell 100 units this year, whatever thing we are selling, and let's assume I'm, I'm hitting my target and I sell 100, but the competitor sold 200 which means the 100 doesn't really mean much. So I, I wasn't really successful, but I was because I hit my target. But compared with the others, I wasn't. And also vice versa, if the competitor only sold like 20, well, wow, I was highly successful. So targets often make only sense, especially in this adaptive, fast-moving world, if they are relative to something else. It could be also relative to our own learning, right? Um, then the other thing is the forecast, so which is like, what do we think will happen? Well, because things are changing so fast, it doesn't make sense to make a forecast for, for a whole year, but more like, at least whenever something is changing, we should have another look at 
how did we think it all turns out and where do we need to adapt and adjust. So that's the, the second thing. And then the third thing, and I have to, well, at least it's a warning probably for myself. So when I see resource, and here it says resource allocation, what I think with my actual background, I think resource, oh, somebody uses this bad term for people, and we, we know that people are not resources, they are humans. The beyond budgeting people mean with resource actually the money. So it deals with like where do we spend the money? And of course we can spend the money also on people, so there is a connection, but we can spend it in on all kinds of things. So the recommendation here is to have a dynamic resource allocation, meaning whatever we learn from now the rolling forecast, we make a decision where is it wise for us to spend the money on, right? What kind of product or project or however you run your company? And that's the beyond budgeting thing. Now, how am I doing? I don't know. Open space, the, the other stream coming here in it. So let me do a check. Who knows open space? There are some. So open space is actually a facilitation technique, and you heard already one of the principles um, which um, Naresh at the beginning stated, which was the law of two feet, which says, well, whenever you feel like you are in, for example, a meeting where you can't learn anything and you can't contribute to the learning of others, you better take your feet with your brain and go somewhere else because your brain has long gone somewhere else because you're not learning and you're not contributing to the learning. So basically, open space is based on self-organization or what I learned from the open space experts while writing the book, actually the key word for open space is invitation. It's always based on we invite everyone to contribute, for example, to the learning, but also to contribute with ideas, with, um, well, with their passion into making any kind of difference. So um, maybe I try try to do this quickly. So open space comes actually from the, hmm, probably the fact that at conferences most is going on in the breaks because there the networking and the deep dives are happening. And because of that, open space took that as kind of principle saying, well, with the love to feed, you're not waiting, uh, you're not standing with somebody where you feel like, oh, this is boring, so you move on and go somewhere else where it's not boring for you. So you go along with your passion. And you're also standing there as long as you want to, and you're not waiting till the conversation is starting, you just start it. And you are not waiting till the right people are there, you're just talking to the people who are there. So everyone is the right people. So these are kind of the, the basic principles of open space. So the, the, the one thing now taking this on an organizational level also means that maybe you've wondered about that, that passion is bound by responsibility. So it doesn't mean everyone can do just anything. It means it's bound by the responsibility, which is the overall strategy of the company. But anyone can suggest anything. And just give you maybe one example, which is um, Valve, which is the, the company being implemented using open space. It's a company producing games. And they are just saying everyone can suggest a new product and um, if there are enough other people who have interest in building that product, they are just building it. But if there are not enough people building that product, it will not happen. So that's open space. Then sociocracy is um, mainly based on equivalence. It looks at the power structure and it tries to make decisions in a shared decentralized way. So there are two key things. The one is making decisions based on consent, which says like, okay, we are asking for acceptance and not for agreement. So it's more, can I live with a decision and not am I in favor with the con decision? So that's compared to consensus. And um, to, yeah, and the other quick, the other kind of key thing is embed 
feedback in the organizational structure, which is called double linking. So from every level in the hierarchy, you have people elected as representatives, which will be one level in the hierarchy higher up, and represent the team group below or unit below, which means the double linking um, solves that separation of concerns you see with sandwich positions we often characterize middle management with. So middle management often where we say, okay, they need to ensure that the decision that we made top down are ensured there, but also they have to speak for their own group or unit. So they are kind of squeezed in the middle. That's why that sandwich position is coming from. And so we want to separate this out. There's one is the appointed manager, it's just a regular hierarchy, and the other one is the um, from the bottom up, that's the double link building in that feedback. Okay, and then there is agile, and agile is basically continuous learning through feedback, so making this quick. And so the, the key thing with that is a plan to inspect, adapt, and I assume you all are aware and know about Edge, so I don't want to dive more into that. But those four streams together, they provide basically the implementation for those values. So transparency is create transparency, I'm reading it that out for all involved in two directions, by providing information and lowering the barrier to those seeking information. So it's no like hiding information because of maybe I want to protect my power, but if somebody need, needs the information, I provide it. So it's both ways, providing it and seeking for it. Then continuous learning, always learning, contribute to others' learning, get feedback and adapt. We have constant customer focus. We have heard that, especially two days ago at the Business Agility Day, that the customers in at the core of business agility. So focus wide on every aspect of the company, product and process, structure and strategy, individual contribution and people. They are all focusing on the customer. Then self-organization, which is use accountable cross-functional teams that select themselves and follow their passion with responsibilities. So it all kind of brings those four streams together. Now, this is how those four streams build in or implement those values. There's actually more to it, which is that bringing those two, to, those four together also changes the way we actually you should look uh, yeah, look at the organizational charts. And this was kind of a surprise for us when we were, were um, looking into that stuff. So the basic classic way of looking at an org chart is like, well, the shore shareholders are in control. Then we have the board, and um, I have to quote my, my colleague co-author John Buck here, he often has that nice saying, well, the board is kind of sitting on a veranda and surveying its property. And the property is like the support service teams, like HR and finance and so on, and then there's production. So that's kind of how it uh, is laid out. Now, one, one problem which has nothing to do now with the whole bossa nova, but it was something that came up for us, is that for organizational charts, they actually depict the static structure of a company. And often what we think it also depicts is the dynamics. But that's not true. Well, at least not in all ways. So but what you hear when people think an organizational chart depicts the dynamics is at least I hear that at times. Well, if we would work the way the organizational chart shows how we are connected, nothing will get done here. And the other thing is also that people say, well, maybe you want to look at whom are you working with and so on, so which is often called trusted networks. However, even those, you can only do snapshots because it depends what you are working on, how the connection is, is really there. So, for example, if you look for career advice, you go to somebody else than if you look for understanding a specific technical framework and you will work with different people, so there are completely different connections. So, the, my, my point here is an org chart just has like, well, it still has value because it shows like a main grouping, which makes sense in some way, so it can show 
geographical grouping, so capabilities or skills or are also key connections for working together and producing something. So this is more like a warning whenever you see an organizational chart, it just does one thing. It doesn't show the dynamics. And um, now, I said like looking at the four streams changed something for us in how we think an org chart should look like. So the one thing is that at the core of the company now should be what's called a value center or all those cross-functional teams providing the value for the customer. Well, if the customer is at the core of what we are doing, that has to be shown somehow. And then there are the support service teams which are more like the connection to the society at large, meaning also regulations, but also the ones we connect with, like suppliers, vendors. Um, and like everything we want, everybody we want to work with. And then, of course, it's also the ball to whom we have like a direct connection. However, you always see these double connections, which might remind you already on the double linking. So that's what we have in mind. So there should always be a double link from each side also with the customer. And by the way, if you read product owner here, product owner for us, it's more a uh, function than a role. So it's more like, okay, we need to have the connection with the customer and it's not meant necessarily you have that person who has that role. Okay, so this is um, like the, this part of the value center as the core. There's actually a bit more to it, which we call now the art and spirit perspective. And this goes more into, if you heard Steve Denning's talk, the keynote and also his other talk, this goes more in the direction of strategic agility. Because now it brings in, which comes actually mainly from open space, so everything around innovation, inspiration, passion, creativity, also more reaching out to the broader community. It could be crowdsourcing, swarming, all this in order to really come up with innovation, which is different than your connection to the customer because you, you know your customer. Now we're talking about art and spirit. We can open up a completely new market. And maybe there some of them will then be customers later on. So, um, yeah, I guess that's, um, that's good enough for here. So if it all comes together, and still, it only has like one, one perspective on it and one depiction. And if you would look at how people are working together, you probably would find out there are many more errors going back and forth. But in the, in the core of the whole org chart uh, the, is the value center, the cross-functional team, teams providing the value, which is actually the first thought we got from that about that was in Beyond Budgeting. They talk about that a lot. Um, and of course, you probably know in Edge we talk about cross-functional teams too. And then the support service teams, HR, finance, regulation, all of them supporting, creating the value. Talk about customer board and then the connection with the art and spirit. However, they are all also connected at the dotted circle. So that makes the whole new thing. So, okay, now what does this mean? So maybe now you heard, okay, those four values, different perspective on the org chart, but now what, what does it really mean? And what it means is, and that's the last, I hope, maybe more difficult picture here, is that if you want to change something in a company, what really changes is, well, at the end, it's kind of the culture. But changing the culture is not that you say, okay, now we change the culture. That's not how it's happening. Culture is changing by different behaviors and habits, and they are expressed in, like, what do we do with our strategy? How do we behave and act on, in our processes? And how are we structured? And all these three structure, strategy, processes actually characterize companies. It's, it's also something, well, there, there's, yeah, a lot of, um, there are many papers out there, it, or research actually, 
where you say, see like, well, strategy follows structure, but then there are also papers saying, no, no, there's proof that structure follows strategy. And the same is true that processes follow structure, but also the structure follows the process. So it's all kind of connected. The other way of looking at it, when I say like companies are characterized like that, it's like the structure is like when we say, well, a company has an organization, and that's kind of the hierarchy or however we are structured. Or it's being organized, and this is how these are the processes we are using. Or it is an organization, it is more like, okay, what's our purpose here, which is the strategy. So this is kind of thing how they are together. So I'm, I showed you that I promise it's kind of last, which is a bit more difficult here. Um, I showed you this because what we did is now looking at what are different probes, trials, experiments, baby steps, speaking with Linda's work, you can do in order to change the habits, behaviors for processes, structure, and strategy. And this way, implementing or preparing yourself for digitalization. And um, again, this might not be readable everywhere, but the thing is, we found those different probes that really track back to, okay, and this is a way how you can implement something for changing your processes or for changing your strategies. I just want to show um, in the next slides, I think, like two different probes we have for strategy changes or pro yeah, test experiments and also for, for structure, of course, we have those two. So looking at probes for strategy, one sample probe, which is also a kind of maybe a simple but an important tr probe, which is called like, is trust cheaper? And um, the background is that travel expenses are often really burdensome and they are annoying. So, and the, the thing is that the way travel expense procedures are built up is that it's assumed that the company can't trust their own people. The key thing often is, well, people can be trusted, but there will be always like one exception. You know, somebody will abuse their trust. The thing is, now we're coming up with procedures, meaning that everyone else will suffer from that mistrust because they will be mistrusted by, from that one abuse of trust. So our hypothesis is that such procedures cost more than they save and they are demoralizing. So then the experiment, what you can do is, first of all, make a pre-measurement and see, okay, how is the moral and how is it that people think about the travel expense procedures. Then you try for three months. For example, one thing you can try, and that's what a company we, we know of is doing, so they have guidelines saying, well, there are exactly three things you have to watch out for. So one thing is, wherever you are going, so you are spending money on your travel, it has to be legal how you spend it. So no nothing that's not legal. Well, that's a good advice at least. Then the second thing is, you should take care of yourself. So don't make anything that's, well, for example, me coming over to Germany, maybe it, uh, coming over from Germany or flying back, it could be much cheaper if I make like seven connections and fly over whatever, but that would mean I take care of myself, really. And the third thing is it should be economically sensible, but it just said that, really. Economically sensible and not anything else. So it's in relation to what we are doing. And so the, the experiment has come up with, for example, guidelines like these, try for three months and then do a post measurement and see if things have improved, also if the, the trust is going up here and, and the moral is going up. And if it's not working, maybe you should come up with something else and if it's working, you can roll it out. And um, so that company I, I uh, was talking about, so they are doing this now for many years, so this is working fine for them. Another example probe, just to have like 
two examples. Can we be more scientific? And the background for that is that, well, in your company, there are probably a lot of places where people are quite scientific. So they, they research or look what kind of research studies are out there, and they're using it and learning from them, and they publish and so on. But that actually typically doesn't happen in management style of working. So we kind of, the, the intelligence we are creating on the management level is still kept as a secret and even inside a company, every unit starts learning the same lesson. So and the question is, can we be more scientific also in a way how we do things like management, leadership, and, and things like that. So it's not done in isolation. And the hypothesis is that, that we can increase cross-company collaboration thinking by sharing lessons from experimentation. And um, there, our experiment, or the experiment that we, you could try and set up is having a peer-reviewed journal where you report your experiment in management practices. And this journal, um, at first, probably it's better to have it like company internally and not like, yeah, cross, across companies. However, you could also do that, which would be another step in your experiment. And then you can monitor like numbers of contributions, reviews, searches, and also uses of what you've learned inside your, inside the company. So these were just like two sample probes that what, what can be done in order to implement these four values that prepare you for digitalization. And the way it's working actually is, well, you look at what is your own context. So reflect your situation. So we're starting at the top. Then you compare the probes that are there to your situation and see if something is fitting. And if some, something is fitting, you try and experiment. And then again, you reflect your situation. But at best, you also publish that to your peers. What's your experience with that? So others can learn from it. And if you are there, then your next step would be not using the probes that are out there, but kind of doing the same thing, but a little bit different, which is, now it doesn't say compare probes, but it says design probes. So come up with their own little baby steps and try those. When they, so again, come up with like, what's the context for it? So that was the background section. What's their hypothesis? What do you want to achieve with implementing that probe? And then pre and post measure and see what you can learn from it. And then report on it and that, that would be great so other people can learn from, from it. And so at first I thought I'm absolutely running out of time and now I've realized that I have much time left, but this is great because then I think we have really great time for discussions and questions. So, so far, thank you very much and I'm happy to take your questions.